Calvary family. I look around, I'm just blessed this morning with, with the folks that are here. One, we're just blessed with our church family up front beginning to end anyway. Uh, but to have, to have Crawfords with us, that's a, that's a unique blessing. Welcome. The Fitches, uh, Weisses, just, it's good to have you with us. It really is. Um, and, and many others as well. And Brother Ken, you know, three score and ten years ago. I remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. You came out with that Canadian cry. Yeah. Yeah. They spanked him. He said, hey. So thankful. One more time in 2023 when we get to huddle around God's word. It's pretty cool. Amen? We still get to gather together without fear of anybody coming through the doors to huddle around God's word. I don't know what 2024 looks like, and neither do you. What I do know is that we have some choices to make. And today will serve as part one of what is really a two-part deal with one table next Sunday. So before you open your Bibles and turn to Galatians 6, I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we confess our taking for granted the multiple copies of your word that many of us have at our disposal in print and electronic form. We're so busy encouraging one another about different items, about different possessions, about different procedures, about different books that we should read. We have so many voices that fill our heads. The world and its multiplicity vies for our attention. struggles quite valiantly for our affections, our allegiance. But we need, we need to hear what the Spirit of Christ has to say through the Word of Christ to the body of Christ. Please, Father, continue, continue to use the work and ministry, your spirit in the midst of Calvary Baptist Church, that that would be the joy of our gathering. To hear you, to glory in Christ, to make much of him, to be a blessing to others as we faithfully follow. Thank you again for the opportunity to hear, to obey with joy, with spontaneity. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 6. I know this is something that you know. But I know that it's something that I and we need to be reminded of again. Choices, choices, choices. 
We make multiple choices every day. Decision after decision after decision. The choices we make, the decisions we make, and the character with which we make them say something about what we believe to be true about God. Every choice says something about what we believe to be true about God. What to do, what to do, what to do. Here's the the big question that I want to address today. Here's the big question for this week and next week, and it's something that it is good to get squared away on, especially at the end of one year going into the beginning of a new year. This is not a New Year's resolution. It should not be. But if it helps you to make it feel like that, go ahead and use it as such. But New Year's resolutions, those are dangerous things because we make them. And then upon first failure, we feel that failure and we give up on the whole resolution, which really isn't a resolution at all, right? It's a New Year kind of wish, a New Year thought, if you will. I think this year I'm going to try to eat healthier. Amen and amen. I don't know what it is about January 15, 16, but I give up for the rest of the year. But it was a good two-week run. Amen? I'm going to read my Bible through this year. I don't know what it is, but there's something about January 2nd And we give up on the whole thing. But here's the question. In what or whom will I glory in 2024? We have decisions to make. Amen? While it is true we have a decision to make, you and I both know this is going to come down to decisions, multiple, many, daily, moment by moment, decision after decision. In what or whom will we glory? To what kingdom will I swear allegiance this year? To what kingdom will I swear allegiance in my next decision? To what kingdom will I swear allegiance in my interaction with my wife and my children and my grandchildren? To what kingdom will I swear allegiance in the midst of my life with my church family? To what kingdom will I swear allegiance with the use and stewardship of my money? To what kingdom will I swear allegiance in my speech toward others, for others? To what kingdom will I swear allegiance with the moments, the minutes, the hours, the days, the time spent in this coming year? To what kingdom will I swear allegiance with the use of my thoughts and the stewardship of my mind? To what kingdom will I swear allegiance even in my religious activity? According to what standard Will I live and breathe? In the end, whose story do I truly care about? And to what or to whom do I surrender my life? These are serious questions. And the answers to these questions, ultimately just one question, 
asked a multitude of ways. The answers to these questions hold both the present and the future of your life. This is weighty. Amen? The answers to these questions hold both the present and the future of your life. The answers to these questions hold the present and the future of the life of Calvary Baptist Church. The answers to these questions really hold life and death in the balance. Will I this day and in the days ahead choose to glory in myself or to glory in the cross of Jesus Christ? Will I in this moment choose to glory in myself or to glory in the cross of Jesus Christ? When Tuesday comes, all too early, will I choose to glory in myself or in the cross of Jesus? Choices to make. Decision, decision, decision. Galatians chapter 6, the whole ending of this letter written to the churches of Galatia. Beginning in verse 11, Paul, under the superintendence of the Holy Spirit, writes these words. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast. But the whole motive is that they would be able to boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified unto me, and I have been crucified to the world. For neither Circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision. A new creation is the whole deal. Amen and amen. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. You can see the distinction here. Are going to glory... In ourselves, are we going to glory in the flesh? Or are we going to glory in the cross of Jesus Christ? We have choice that is set before us. And Paul is making, at the end of the fullness of his argument, he is reminding some of what he's communicated before, and he gets to the motives of those who are looking at, who are looking at people who are coming to know Christ as Savior and Lord in the churches of Galatia who are saying, don't get me wrong, Jesus Christ is important, he's just not sufficient. Jesus Christ is important, he's just not enough. You need to be circumcised in order to truly, truly be in. You need to be circumcised in order to truly be made right with God. You see it in verse 13 and 12. Those who are circumcised want to force you, those who are circumcised, verse 13, want you, verse 12, want to force you to be circumcised. And there are motives behind this. And this is where I think it'll provide us great clarity. Here are some words I want you to remember. What is this glory in in the flesh? 
Well, one, it is for those who want to make a good showing in the flesh. This is a matter of religious arrogance. Do you see it? They want to make a good showing in the flesh. These are the kinds of things that we saw when Jesus was talking and, and teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. In those words in the Sermon on the Mount, when he was talking around, he talked about giving. And there are those who give, and they give in a, in a certain way where they can be seen by all. Are you with me? They can be seen by all. They, they've gotten their reward for the day. Everybody has seen what they're doing. But it's about themselves. It's not about the Lord Christ. It's not about the glory of God. It is about them. I need for everybody to see what I am doing and how much I am giving in order for people to look at me and say, what a person, instead of looking at the Lord Christ and saying, what a Savior. He said similar things when it came to prayer. You be careful not to pray like those who get in the open spots and they take their time and they pray with eloquent words and they make sure that everybody hears them all the time in their prayers. And their prayers are framed and formed in such a way that they are more concerned about what the people are hearing from them than they are in communicating with God himself. Don't pray that way. In fact, when you pray, pray like this. The first three petitions. Cause your name to be central, not mine. Cause your name to be central on earth just as it is in heaven. Cause your moral rule to be accomplished in us and through us on earth just as it is in heaven. Cause your will, your kingdom to be put in order in us and through us on earth just as it is in heaven because this is what we need. The glory of your name, your kingdom, your will, not ours. Jesus went on to talk about fasting in much the same way. Some people would even color themselves up in certain ways and hold themselves certain ways so that people would know they're a really deeply spiritual person. They look gaunt, don't they? Yes, oh, they must be fasting. They must be experiencing a deep time of fellowship with God. So you don't need that for public praise because that's not what fasting is about. Fasting is often linked with prayer for the purpose of fasting, reminding you through those hunger pains why you are fasting. What it is that you are pleading with God to accomplish in and through you or others. It's not about you. It's about the glory of God in action. Jesus has taught us this. Now Paul is reminding us of the character of our Lord Christ right here again. Be very careful. Be very careful of religious arrogance. No action, no ceremony, nothing you or I can do can add to the person and work of Jesus Christ that has been accomplished through his sinless life, his substitutionary atoning sacrificial death where he paid the penalty for our sins, and his resurrection where he defeated Satan, sin, and the grave. Nothing can be added to that. Remember, Paul is after motives here. Not just the acts. It's not as if works of righteousness don't matter. They do but they're motivated by gratitude to God to show the glory of God to a world that needs to see the activity of God in our lives individually and in our life collectively as the church. So 
also the motives. There are those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who will push hard for adding to the work of Christ, which in turn minimizes the work of Christ. And I would say this. There are those who want, and through their activity, will strive to distract you from the person and work of Jesus Christ. You've experienced it, I experience it. Most of us experience it daily. Religious people, non-religious people, the thoughts, attitudes, philosophies, and motives of the world that we adopt as our own. A matter of religious arrogance causes us to glory in ourselves and live life for us. Those who want to force you to be circumcised, they, they're motivated as a matter of religious arrogance. They're also motivated as a matter of being a coward. Still in verse 12, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they not be persecuted for the, cost, for the cross of Christ. It will be increasingly if Christ is not at our center, it will become increasingly desirable for us as followers of Jesus to take the path of least resistance. We've been communicating this for a number of years. If you didn't see movement in our culture and society in 2023, you were asleep. We have choices to make. As a church and as church people. Are we seriously giving our lives to follow Christ regardless of the cost? These people are motivated out of fear. They're cowards. I don't want to be persecuted for the cross of Christ. You've got to remember in this culture, the cross, that's, that's just an ugly, shameful, dishonorable thing. It's terrible. Why, why would those who talk about a king who triumphs, why would they attach themselves, their life and their death, why would they attach their life story to a cross, the most shameful, dishonorable image that we could possibly attach our life to. Shameful. Especially for some of their Jewish friends who want nothing to do with the cross, and I'm trying to come up with a compromise here. I'm just trying to make it through without ruffling any feathers. I'm trying to make it through without taking any heat on me or adding any heat to the church. I don't want that to happen. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, yeah, uh, Jesus Christ is important, but, and the cross of Christ uh, is, is important, but, but we're going to add all of this other stuff in order that we can, we can make the gospel somehow more palatable. What does Paul say earlier on in Galatians? He says these words, literally, Oh, you stupid Galatians! How is it that when you were given the gospel of Jesus Christ that you turned so quickly to another gospel which is no gospel at all? Those are his words under the superintendence of the Holy Spirit. How could you receive the gospel, freedom from the bondage of sin? How could you receive and participate in the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Christ? 
How could you hear the reality and experience the reality that you've been made free brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ and turn to something that places you in bondage again? It doesn't make any sense. But you're going to have people in 2024 who out of fear are going to want you to compromise in a number of areas. This will come from believers and non-believers alike. In what or whom will you glory? To what kingdom will you swear allegiance? According to what standard will you live and breathe? They do this in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross. Here is a principal motive. I will advocate legalism in my life in order to protect my life and my material welfare. This can happen in personal and corporate life. I don't want to get attacked. So I will cower in the face of opposition. In the name of tolerance, I will let faulty thinking continue in order that we can keep finances up and numbers up in the church. In order to sustain market stability. God forbid. Amen? I don't want to be persecuted by identifying with Jesus Christ, so I will only speak His name and walk according to His standard while I am with those who do the same. When I am with those who lift high the name of Jesus in song, I will gladly lift high the name of Jesus in song with them. When I am with those who speak the name of Jesus beautifully in conversation, I will join them in speaking the name of Jesus with great joy in conversation. But when I am not with those people who are just like me, I will not speak a word of the name of Christ. I will not say anything of his great and gracious salvation. You get me out of the environment where I am with the people who are exactly like me, and I will continue to go with the flow regardless of the direction or the contamination of that stream. In what or whom will I glory? To what kingdom will I swear allegiance? According to what standard will I live and breathe? Interestingly, These people Paul is discussing in this particular portion of Scripture, they identify themselves with the church. You see that clearly, right? They identify themselves with the church, but not with the finished work of the cross, and therefore not truly with Christ. So it's a matter of religious arrogance, It's a matter of being a coward, and it's a matter of hypocrisy, verse 13. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law. They're circumcised, they just aren't participating in the things that really matter to God. 
those who speak the loudest about one particular portion of the law many times will show blatant disregard for walking according to the standard of the Spirit as a whole lifestyle in Christ. That can be true of me. That can be true of any one of us. If we are not consistently walking in the Spirit, choosing one decision at a time, one good, godly decision at a time to follow hard after Christ. And you're going to be pressed at every place. Young people, you're going to be pressed in 2024 even harder than you were in 2023. We got a bunch of you graduating this year. Life hits hard. And you've got decisions to make. But you've got to figure out how you're even going to frame the questions. You've got to think deeply about how to frame the questions in order that you can even begin to rightly determine how to make a good, godly decision to honor Christ. In what or whom will you glory? To what kingdom will you swear allegiance? According to what standard will you live and breathe? If we thought about it in these terms, it seems like it'd be easy, doesn't it? This all sounds great. Arrogance, cowardice, hypocrisy. Who's up for it? Amen, pastor. Let's have an altar call. I'm coming for arrogance. I would be coming for cowardice, but I just don't think I can make it up to the front. Me, I'm all about hypocrisy. See, not one of us would say these things. Amen? Not one of us would want to identify with these characteristics. Knowing that to be true, how about, by God's grace and for His glory, under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we hold one another accountable so that we don't participate in those kinds of life decisions. So that we do glorify God. So that we do honor Him and love Him. That we don't walk in arrogance, self-glorifying. That we don't walk in cowardice, self-glorifying. That we don't walk in hypocrisy, self-glorifying. May it never be. Again, this is really what Paul, under the superintendence of the Holy Spirit, has been saying in Galatians chapter 3 and even earlier in Galatians 6. May it never be that I would embrace any other gospel which is no real gospel at all. May it never be that I would ever boast in anything Save the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Arrogance, cowardice, hypocrisy. This is glorying in our own flesh. Yet Christ has called us to come home and cease glorying in our flesh. That's the call of the gospel. We embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ when by the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit convicting us of sin and righteousness, we came to the end of ourselves and said, I give up. 
I agree with God. I agree with you as to what you have to say about yourself. I agree with you about what you have to say about my own sin and sins and sinfulness. I agree with you with what you have made known about the Lord Jesus Christ and his life, death, and resurrection. And I accept the call to faith and repentance. I'm coming home to cease glorying in my own flesh and turn to glorying in the cross of Jesus, the person of Jesus, the work of Jesus, the grace of Jesus, the peace that only Jesus offers in order that we may enjoy to the fullest the freedom that Jesus gives. Amen. Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. In this cross I find my identity. You're going to continue to be pushed and you're going to be con- you're going to continue to be pushed hard in 2024. on all sides to find your chief identity outside of the person and work of Jesus Christ. You will be pushed by some to find your chief identity in the color, the pigment of your skin. Don't fall for it. White, black, brown, doesn't matter. Don't fall for it. That's not a Christ. Christ did away with all that in the cross of Calvary. Not different pigmentation of skin. Still exists. Amen? Well, I saw you look down. You and I, we have different pigmentation, right? We just do. Brother in Christ, equal standing at the foot of the cross as I do. You're you're going to be pushed by others that somehow your your chief identity is found in your socioeconomic status. Don't fall for it. That's not of Christ. That's something completely different. You're going to have others. Multiple different identities. Because when our chief identity is not found in the person and work of Jesus Christ, but in something else, it causes great division in Christ's church. And Christ has created a unified people under the headship, lordship of Jesus and Jesus alone. Amen? We have no king but Christ. You're going to be hammered in so many different ways in 2024 to have your chief identity be Republican or Democrat or independent. Please, brothers and sisters, one and all, we are followers of Jesus. Amen? Don't fall for it. That has everything to do with arrogance, cowardice, and hypocrisy. Our chief identity is in Jesus Christ. God forbid that I would boast in anything but the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. In this cross, I find my identity in the cross of Jesus Christ where he paid for the penalty of my sin. And the cross of Jesus Christ is is shorthand for the fullness of the gospel. In the life of Jesus Christ, that righteous life which was lived for us, that sinless life, a life that was required of us that we could not live, that righteousness of Jesus Christ for those of us who have placed faith in Jesus, that righteous record of Jesus' sinless life became our record of righteousness before the Father. Thank God for that. My life and breath are wrapped up in the cross of Jesus Christ. My hope, the depth 
of my true comfort in good times and difficult times is wrapped up in the person and work of Jesus Christ. My salvation and my strength, even in the midst of my weakness, is found in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Why would I glory in myself? Why would I boast in anything or anyone save Jesus? His grace, my peace, Jesus, only Jesus. In this cross, we find the love of God toward us. 1 John 4.10 And this is love. And it's not that we loved God. Rather that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation, the satisfaction for our sins. In this cross of Christ, we find Christ has freed us from the bondage of sin. Therefore, Paul says, Again, under the superintendence of the Holy Spirit, far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me. We have choices to make. We have a decision to make as we leave 2023 and we move into 2024. In this cross of Christ, we find Christ has freed us from the bondage of sin. The world has been crucified to me. My position with God in Jesus Christ is that I am dead to sin. Sin no longer has controlling authority over me unless I am willing to give it that kind of authority. We have some choices to make. We have a decision to make. In what or whom shall I glory? To what kingdom will I swear allegiance? According to what standard will I live and breathe? The world has been crucified to me. And I have been crucified to the world. I give myself to practical, holy living before God out of the deepest sense of gratitude for the person and work of Jesus Christ and the salvation he's offered. We have some decisions to make. We have some choices that we have to come to grips with. You see, my identity was my shared identity with the world system and thought and self-glorifying. All of this, Christ saved me from all of this. And, and he, God brought me into the kingdom of his dear son. I was dead. And he made me alive. I was in darkness. But he brought me to light. I was his enemy. And he's made me his child and welcomed me home in Jesus, only Jesus. The world, then that, that's crucified to me. And I'm crucified to it. I 
Because I surrender. I bow the knee and have made the decision to swear allegiance to Jesus alone. Both this day and all the moments that God gives me throughout all eternity. So when anybody says, why, why, why did you do what you did? Jesus, only Jesus. Why did you make that decision? Why did you move in that direction? Why did you show love that way? Why did you respond that way, Jesus? Only Jesus. The law, the flesh, we ourselves could never make ourselves a new creation, but Jesus Christ could and he did. You look around. Better yet, just look in the mirror. I know who I am apart from Christ, and it is quite ugly. I know who He's made me to be. I'm so thankful. This day, and forevermore, I am so thankful that He chose to redeem me in Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful that he chose to redeem so many who are gathered here today under the lordship of Jesus Christ to be reminded of your identity. By which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world because in the end of the entire argument, it's not as if circumcision or uncircumcision is the deal. It is Christ making all things new. It is Christ taking me from spiritual deadness and making me alive in Christ. It is Christ freeing me from the bondage of sin and enabling me to live life the way he always wanted me and intended for me to live, the way of blessing. And that way of blessing is to surrender to Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and to God alone. The cross brings peace and mercy. And those who walk by the rule of this gospel, peace, peace, with a new relationship with God for all eternity and mercy, with God's removal and forgiveness of sin. Grace to you and peace. For those who have come home to Jesus, We've got some decisions to make. Weighty, important decisions. You choose today Plead with the Holy Spirit to shine his brilliant holy light in the darkest crevices of your human heart and mind. Think deeply. Pray deeply. In what or whom shall I glory? Myself? Or Jesus? To what kingdom will I swear allegiance? My own? And orient my life decisions around that goal solely? Or the kingdom of Jesus, who has brought about a new creation? 
The old has passed away. The new has come. To what kingdom will you swear allegiance? According to what standard will we choose to live and breathe? I decide for myself. I take my cue from social media and determine what's best for me. Or I follow Jesus and walk in the Spirit and choose to live according to the standard of the Holy Spirit. choices to make. For those who have come home to Jesus, live in freedom. Live in the fullness of freedom and choose to glory in the cross by whom in which the world is crucified to us. We are crucified to the world. It's always been about Jesus. Only Jesus. I ask you to quiet your hearts before the Lord in this moment. those who are embracing Jesus as Savior and Lord. That you commune with the Lord in prayer. And you start the journey of making some of those very important decisions as we head out of 2023 and into 2024. In what or whom will you glory? To what kingdom will you swear allegiance? According to what standard will you live and breathe? Praise team, join me, please.